I was very surprised by, uh, pleasantly surprised by the sophistication of the comments. Uh, I mean, people who I would not expect them to possibly even speak English. They spoke like college professors. I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I qualified what I said before. Sounded. I knew I'm going to sound pejorial somehow. I apologize. I'm just okay. Whatever. For, that was my impression. I'm sorry. That was my impression. Okay. So anyway, so I and I was I was I said I was very pleasantly surprised because the neighborhood. What we felt was because a little bit... Because the didn't look like people would be educated? The gentrification of uh, Highland Park started back in the early 1990s when city planning revised the uh, Northeast Los Angeles Community Plan. Uh, the Northeast Los Angeles Community Plan is a general plan. It's uh, more like a master plan to revitalize certain areas, communities in Los Angeles. Um, and in this general plan, they have specific plans. Highland Park is split up in two districts, District 1 and District 14, and both have uh, each specific plans uh, from the general plan to revitalize uh, our communities, more or less to gentrify our neighborhood. The specific plan for uh, District 1 was called the Avenue 57 TOD, uh, Transit Oriented District. And this plan was based around the new Gold Line station that they built. Um, the major activity center is around between Avenue 55 and Avenue 60 on Figueroa. They were also going to build a um, an art walk section down Avenue 57. Currently, right now, between Avenue 55 and Avenue 60, the major care, uh, activity center, there is currently around 18 liquor license. Um, whenever a restaurant or a bar uh, opened up on Figueroa between that area, they always referred to the specific plan, the Avenue 57 TOD, to get their liquor license um, real fast, uh, fast tracked. Uh, so right, that's why they have a it's just so oversaturated of liquor license between the area is because of the specific plan, the Avenue 57 TOD, to revitalize the area, to gentrify in that area. Property owners, back in the early 60s, I've got the letter from somebody here. So this is, th these lots were owned by public? By, by private the people who lived in Highland Park before it was as hip as it is now. And they 
they got tired of taking care of these empty lots. So they said to the city, hey, we're going to give you these lots. Here's this paper here. In 1962, these parcels were transferred to the city of Los Angeles by the adjacent landowners. And the purpose for the transfer was for the city to pave them and maintain them as public parking for the use of the adjacent commercial properties. So the city got the land for free, but they had to pave it and let the businesses use this parking for free, which they don't do today. There's meters on every one of these parking spots. Yeah, I see that. <laughs> yeah. So somebody could take them to task for that, right? Yeah. But who's going to do that? Um, so in order for the development to go through, it was a private, a public, the city being the public, and a private developer going in together. The city cannot sell this property because it was gifted to them okay. for the purpose of public parking for the businesses on Figueroa Street. Okay. But they can lease it without selling it. So they were going to lease the land to the developer but they were going to sell the developer all of the airspace that the buildings were going to be built on. They were selling air. They were selling airspace. Yeah. Airspace. I don't know. And they're. <laughs> I don't ask me how to explain that one. That one I just let go over my head. <laughs> but they were leasing the land. Mm -hmm. But they were. They were selling, selling the airspace. And part of the airspace counted as underground because mm. the parking was all going to be underground so it was going to be two floors two, oh, okay. story, two stories underground of parking for this space this lot and for the mr t's that lot back that there lot. but not for the small one on 59 because those were going to be condos that were going to be privately sold at market value they did some core samples here because before these were parking lots the camera shop that's next door to um, I don't know, this Compass building. Uh, it used to be Cress. The Frank's building, right? Yeah, Frank's building. Yeah. And then there's a, there is a camera shop on, on one side or the other. They used to throw their chemicals in the garage that used to be on this side of the alley. Okay. As well as there used to be an auto mechanics here. Okay. In the day where it was okay just to dump, dump stuff, stuff yeah, on yeah. the ground. And then there was also a water tower, some kind of a steam tower for Amtrak and Union Pacific used to use these lines before it became the gold line. So there's studies- so, Southern Pacific. Yeah, there's studies out there nationally uh -huh. where they're taking old railroad lines that are not used anymore and repurposing them into parks, but they find that they're contaminated. Yeah. And they have to do a decontamination before they turn them into open space. So we were saying, this is a train used to stop here. Yeah. This is contaminated soil. So lots of red flags. And they said, well, we did a, we did a cursory phase one soil sample where they drilled core holes, mm -hmm. eight of them. And um, we were able through one of the planning departments, they were required to do a second phase of the soil samples to see if in fact what kind of chemicals were there yeah. and what they would need to do in order to mitigate it if they were going to go ahead and proceed and build. So just knowing that there were chemicals dumped here and that they would have to do a second phase soil sample, that would trigger an environmental report. Nice. And an environmental report means that they have to spend more money and more time about the environment of the area and the people that live here. And what they wanted to do, they wanted to keep it on the cheap because they knew that this was a working class area who are not literate in fighting the city and multi-billion dollar developers that come in from Illinois. Yeah. So they wanted to do what's called a mitigated negative declaration. And that is basically a boilerplate of little check marks that it'll ask you like, are you exceeding wastewater treatment requirements of the applicable region water quality board? So a lot of people were saying, we already have problems with our plumbing here. You're gonna add all of this other waste on there. This mm -hmm. is gonna back up, traffic's gonna back up. And of course, there's only four boxes 
potentially, potentially significant impact or damage. Second box is potentially significant unless mitigated. That means you do something to fix it so that there is no more problem. Yeah. There is a problem, but you can fix it. Less than significant impact and no impact. So mostly they want to just do these two boxes. The limited, the limited. The limited and the no impact, because then they don't have to do anything. Yeah. And if nobody's reading these boxes yeah. and seeing their checks, then they can push it through. Okay. So there is a lot of money there. And then the, the cleanup to do it properly would cost a lot too, correct? Oh yeah, an environmental impact report costs more in time, and you have to involve the community more, because you're having to tell the community what you found, what yeah. you're doing wrong, what they're going to have to live with after you leave, and the community can come back and say, ah, we don't, we don't like that idea. You're going to have to change it this way. And so they don't want the headache of having to deal with changing their plans. They just want to come in and bada bing, bada boom. See, because if the council member is on board with the developer, and unfortunately in the city of Los Angeles, our council members are on board with any developer that rolls into town yeah. that's going to, you know, they say help out the community, but basically it's large development that's going to benefit the developer and it's going to benefit the city and extra taxes and whatever the yeah. developer is doing. And it's probably a feather in the council members, uh, you know, re-election coffers or something like that. Yeah, yeah, and donating money. And how, how was your experience with Councilman Cedillo in this, through, in, in this, in this battle? So Cedillo was coming on um, to take Ed Reyes's place, right? So he was running for his first time running for city council. Yeah, okay. Here for CD one, and he was he was um, saying, "Oh, I haven't read anything about it. I don't really know about it, but." I'm going to look into it mm -hmm. while he was campaigning. And then he said, yes, that doesn't sound good. I heard from my chief of staff, um, Arturo Chavez, that this developer had not put in any kind of mitigations for the community on a development this large. And that's just not okay. Because they should typically, you know, plant trees in nearby schools, mm -hmm. put up a couple of stop signs or signal lights, you know, repave a street. Do put some money out that benefits the community for doing what it is that they're doing. Yeah. So then he had said that. But ultimately, um, after Cedillo's team said, yeah, Ed Reyes uh, was in the pockets of these developers and knew them personally and went to their barbecues and christened their children, or they christened his children. They told you that? Yes. Wow, okay. Yes. And then our last meeting downtown with them, where they asked us, they asked me and Jesse Rosas and Lloyd Catro to come up with a mitigation. What do we want to let these people build their project? What will it take? Yeah, because they, they built, they, they, they planned around this gold line station. The, and that's how they wanted the trend. It, you know, because that's, because this is literally a David versus Goliath story. Yes. Right? Because I, I think I, I know only two the past 10 years that it fought development and won is one was yours and the other was Hollywood. Hollywood the millennium yeah those are only two developments that I know offhand but the past 10 years that you have stopped it yeah bigger communities who are on top of development they have that power maybe they're not renters or maybe they're uh, they have lawyers in their community or they're more active with the um, um, you know, working in the community can stop those projects right away. Development won't even try to do it yeah. in their place because they know that there's they're going to be stopped at the gate. They're going to have a much <laughs> bigger pushback. Our neighborhoods are hard working class neighborhoods that hardly have any time to get involved yeah. in a project that's going to be 10 years long, right? Yeah. So developers in the city and your city council person know that they gauge the community they know what they can get away with and what what they can't get away with so we were a ragtag group you know single mom two kids yeah uh high school education uh jesse pesquera immigrant small business owner yeah lloyd catro retired old man <laughs> yeah they weren't expecting this fight yes they were not 
they were not expecting us to outlast them. And then you finally won. And then we finally won. Which is great, right? It is really great, but um, we never had a party about it. We did have that one something that was done. Yeah, you behind, had like a little nut, yeah. But we never really did. Truthfully, I was very exhausted. When we lost the first case with Superior Court, I was exhausted and I wasn't going to go forward with the appeal. And Jesse kept saying, no, Lisa, we got to go forward. Don't worry about the money. I'll be in charge of all the fundraising this time. You don't have to do any of it. And then he gave me the Silverstein lawsuit to the Millennium Project in Hollywood. He yeah. Said, Just read this. Just read this. Don't make up your mind yet. Just read this. And I went home and I read that Millennium lawsuit and it was exactly our fight. Yeah. So I said, he won't even have to work hard because he already did it with the Millennium. So then I said, oh, great. I felt some sense of relief. Let's go forward because it's already done. They already did it and they already won. So then that means that we should be able to do it as well. What's your name? My name is Margo Jim. Nice. I am like a man's name. Um, so I thought, well, you know, I was the coordinator of the drive through art gallery 30 years ago. So let me go get my scrapbook out okay. and see if I can find out and remember what happened. So I actually have many photographs here of the very first days of the drive through art gallery. That was 30 years ago. Yes. And what I would like to do is first read something for people to understand. And let me explain one thing. This is from a, a news article from the Arroyo's, Arroyo Art Collective's newsletter back in the 1990s. Okay. It was started. I was a founding member of that organization. Um, and I'm going to read this and then I'll go back and explain. Okay. It's the Arroyo Art Collective receives two grants. This has been a productive month for the Arroyo Art Collective. We received a grant of $5,000 from Sears Savings Bank for our drive through art gallery. We were given a parking lot wall by the Department of Transportation to use for its pilot program 
and we won a grant of $6,000 from the Getty Grant Foundation to hire two college students as full-time interns to work between the drive through art gallery and the land of the serpent, La Tierra de la Culebre. Frank Romero has committed himself to paint five of his magic cars on our wall, and we expect to launch our next segment sometime in June. I myself personally was always fascinated by the writing on the walls of the city of Los Angeles and I'd see all kinds of different lettering styles, different colors, and I go, where does this come from? What do these names mean? Why is this up here? So my curiosity, I kept talking about it to the art collective and somebody said, why don't you write an article about it on graffiti? Mm -hmm. I go, okay. So I set off across the park to find me somebody down in the river doing graffiti so I could talk to them. Um, and I ran across a very uh, open young man who told me a lot about graffiti, showed me the way, showed me the pieces around the neighborhood, explained everything, and became very foundational in the start of the Graffiti Arts Coalition. And I wrote an article about this, and as a result, the Royal Arts Collective gave us a little seed money to buy some spray paint, and we got permission to do a legal wall um, on York Boulevard, and we did it. So um, anyway, we started the uh, drive through art gallery as one of our projects, and we got that original uh, permission to do one of the walls. And honestly, I don't remember. It's very likely we could have just continued on because nobody in the community minded. Uh, they were all for what we were doing. Mm -hmm. You should have seen those parking lots back in those days, and I have photographs in my book. They were cracked. There were weeds growing up. All the walls were tagged. They looked awful. So we went in with beautiful, bright colors and let the artists do their thing. Mm -hmm. And now if you can imagine, 30 years later, piece after piece has been done there. Old pieces have been gone over by new artists um, and it's gone on for 30 years. So yeah. I don't think a lot of people realize that, that it's been part of the community for 30 years, that drive through art gallery. And that's what it was for, to be kind of a museum of, of art you know, a wild style kind of art. Look at the 30 years of history of one artist coming in and painting over another artist. Yeah. It's kind of the way it is with public art, whether whether it's sculpture, paintings, it, it can happen. Uh, and sadly that happened. And what about the Frank Romero mural? He did. I have photographs, I worked on that with him. Yeah. It didn't last too long. It was painted out a lot. I don't know what fool went over there and painted that out. I mean, that would be... Which mural are you talking about? Where at? Frank Romero's, his, his mural was on the wall across from the Ebel Club on yeah. Avenue 50. Okay. Yeah. Was that the, the heart or the cars? That was, what well, was cars and some other imagery. Too. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, I think you have a picture of that. Yeah, I, yeah. I do have pictures of these things. Um, uh -huh. So anyway, so, but that got painted out fairly fast. I mean, it was up there maybe max five years, I think. Okay. I don't, we didn't, could never find out who did that. Um, too bad. It would be a tourist attraction today. <laughs> yeah, he's a, he's a well-known uh, artist around the world, right? Yeah. Famous, world famous. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah I, I think, um, I, yeah, it does happen a lot. But I think, like, for our community at the time, because we're going through, like, gentrification and the erasure of our community, uh, it kind of hit harder, right? Because it was like... You know, not only are, are you taking our business away, you know, you're you're, you're taking our, our community away, and now you're just taking our art. Because it, it, happened, it happened literally like one day. Like, it wasn't just like one wall, the registered wall, it was like three walls. So, yeah, yeah it kind of hit us hard. I understand that, and that's why I was so touched by it, because I knew what it meant, and I knew the background, and that's why I came to you. Um, it was definitely symbolic of what's going on. These walls had art and murals uh, painting all up and down. And last year, uh, the North Figaro Association made a complaint with the deal's office to have them removed. Uh, the complaint went to Cultural Affairs, and since these walls were not registered, uh, they had to be taken down. These walls, uh, the walls uh, behind Owls and Fashion 21 were also uh, erased uh, from the complaint.
So, so how do you feel about the mules being raised uh, in the parking lot walls? Well, to be honest, first we felt disheartened, but then we got angry. And the reason for that is we as artists of color are, are already at so much of a disadvantage. We are already so underrepresented. So for them to do something like that was more than just, I would say, a slap in the face. It was literally taking away resources and identity from the culture that remains here in Highland Park. I literally grew up in school right across the park, right there. So, I mean, I grew up there and all we had was the Southwest Museum. So I grew up without getting to go to these fancy museums. We didn't have LACMA, we didn't have MOCA, we didn't have any of that, you know? So the art that we grew up exposed to that influenced us and created you know more local artists was the art on the walls it had special significance to us because those were our museums it was literally what they erased was called drive-by murals it was a drive-by gallery of artwork by frank romero and you know there were more uh, john zender's aztec warrior has special i would say uh, like significance and uh, i would say it's, it's borderline sacrilegious to remove something of such symbolism to the indigenous culture in highland park so the removal of the murals was sacrilegious that's the best way that i can say it and it was done in such a disrespectful unethical and illegal way they didn't go through protocol they didn't give us due process you know which is it was the ultimate and final slap in the face and not only did they get removed but the artists didn't get notification so it was just done in the most horrible way possible across the board yeah because they just like because i know they went to sidio's office yeah. and they made a complaint Right. And it said Dio's office uh, followed up and cultural affairs stated that they were registered and that, you know, so they didn't reach out to nobody. They just were like, you know what, I don't like these uh, murals and I'm they just going to erase them. They didn't reach out to the artists and they didn't reach out to the community. There was no public document, public posting of any kind on social media or in person stating that these pieces were going to be removed. And if we would like to go at least photograph them and document them. It was done in such a entitled manner that's why the community is so angry and that's how we came together to fight against the people who took them down yeah. when yahara actually sent me what was going down today and what we were planning to do and what we were hoping to represent it really touched me because it really was what i saw on these walls that got me into doing artwork, to expressing myself, into actually leading other people to express themselves and find who they are through their own form of art. And to see that there's just fake walls here now is a travesty. It's sad. It's it's a showing of how our culture isn't being perpetuated in this day and age by the people who are coming here. These people have no respect for what this community was built on, what roots run here. They say that they're here for the betterment of this community, that they want to be integrated into the community, incorporate everybody, and that's not the truth. And that's a representation of that. It's sad. It's sad because these, this is generations of what we had here. Generations. My parents, my grandparents. What 
is a bid a business improvement district okay well in, in the state of california um there's three kinds of of bids uh and in the city of los angeles the only one that really matters is what's called a property bid okay and the way that works is that um people who own commercial property in a in a district like um get together and agree to pay extra property taxes. The city of Los Angeles organizes this for them and they form this district um, that collects extra money from the commercial property owners and uses it to, um, to, to pay for various kind of services in the district. Okay, and what, what, what is the purpose of a, of a bid? Man, okay, the purpose, it's so complicated, all right? Mm -hmm. Law says the purpose is because like there's blighted business areas and they need extra help to kind of like improve the, the blighted situation. And that's what the law says. So I guess as far as the law is concerned, the purpose is to improve uh, commercial areas that are not um, like performing at their peak somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but you know, that's not, it's not used for that, okay? What it's used for probably is, is uh, like, very different around the state because so many different cities, you know, different sizes, everybody has a different situation. But in the city of Los Angeles, um, it's, they're used for uh, like this kind of extra municipal power, like the, the city uh, shifts various city purposes to them, like policing or street cleaning. And th since they're nominally private, they get to do things um, that, that the government is not allowed to do. So like they can uh, chase homeless people away just for the the purpose just purely because they want to chase them away or they can arrest them um with handcuffs for like drinking a beer on the street mm -hmm. which, which the police are not going to do and, and so on um so they're used i think in los angeles as kind of a tool of uh like a, a kind of a way to evade restrictions on government action yeah because okay. we didn't know what a bid was until one day um our murals were erased we had like three walls of murals parking lots and at the time, I asked Conrado at Cedillo's uh, office, I asked him what happened to the murals, and he told me that the North Figure Association uh, erased the murals. And I was like, okay, what the hell is the North Figure Association, right? So then I Googled it, and it's, it's a bid. I'm like, what the hell is a bid? Um, and at the time, the, the members of the bid of the Highland Park, the North Figure Association was Tom Wilson, which he owns the property on um, Avenue 54 Figueroa, that big lot, that super lot. Uh, uh, Misty Iwatsu, which is in the Highland Park bid and the Lincoln Heights bid, if I'm not right, correct. Uh, Amy Inouye Ino and Stu Rappenport. Um, so at the time we called these people out because they erased our murals and it became this whole big thing because I didn't have proof that they erased the murals and uh, they were arguing with us that they didn't erase the murals. And that's when I met you, uh, you contacted me and then uh, you did the California Records Act and you requested, you requested some emails, right? Correct? That's right, yes. And then one of the, the emails that you got was, uh, was gold because it actually had the, the email thread uh, between uh, Councilman Cedillo's office, uh, the bid, and uh, cultural affairs, and they were talking about how they were going to erase the, the murals because there was uh, some graffiti on one of them, and the cultural affairs gave them the right to uh, uh, whitewash the murals. Uh, but the problem was they erased like three parking lots full of them, and one of them was actually registered. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I know that. Um, so let's go. So let's go into like your dealings with the North Figure Association. Okay, so at that time, I, I think maybe that was 2018 when I started looking into to that bid. Um, mm -hmm. At that time, I was just like requesting records from bids all over the city of Los Angeles because I was learning that they were involved in all kinds of nefarious like activities. So I, um, I was just kind of like, starting to understand how all of them fit together. And uh, the first thing, so I asked the North Figure Association for a bunch of emails between them and the city of Los Angeles. And the first thing I spotted was them talking to, what's his name? Bill oh, Cody. Bill Cody. <laughs> yeah. like, they were scared of you. I'd never heard of you before, but they were terrified of you. And you had done something like so scary that he was going to like, you know, take care of you. Okay. So yeah, yeah, it was like an email thread. Yeah, yeah. Right? Like, <laughs> like a mafia. I, I, I didn't know who you were. Or what you did. <laughs> I know, the city of Los Angeles feels that should not be conspiring with bids to take care of people. <laughs> so, not, 
that's why I got in touch with you, you know. I found that film of you uh, talking to Cody on the on uh, Figueroa Street there. Like, at, you remember at the corner where you confronted? Yeah, him? yeah, he, yeah. He was he was spying on us, and I, I caught him. <laughs> so what happened? Okay, so Ed Reyes had the murals erased. Ed Reyes asked about it. Ed Reyes had the Later. No, so you're saying that Ed Ray's erased the mirrors. That's what you just told me. And you told me Conrado would erase the mirrors. That's less than me. You told me Conrado erased the mirrors. <laughs> right, so like that's that's how I started getting to them. Then I found out about the murals and uh and um that's not super interesting. All right. That's like this kind of cultural erasure that bids are are uh involved in all over the city, you know. It's kind of like it's it's a little part of the gentrification machine going mm -hmm. on there, trying to make things culturally more comfortable for the tenants that the landlords want to move into the neighborhood, you know, because they'll yeah. be more that's that's like what's going on there. And bids do that. Bids in Hollywood and downtown have been super involved in that kind of thing also. So that's what really got me interested in them. So you they stopped giving you the California Act. They stopped sending you emails, correct? And they, they hired a lawyer. That, that's what happened is after um, I published those emails that you were talking about with mm -hmm. the cultural affairs, um, they got so much bad press. There were articles in LA Magazine and, and other kinds of uh, fairly big outlets. And Oh, uh, yeah, I remember that. And they just they flipped out and they stopped giving me emails and they hired this lawyer who, who didn't understand the Public Records Act to try to like um, obstruct my access to the emails. Uh, yeah, so so that went on for a few months, and then I had to file a lawsuit against them, which is the only way to force them to comply. And then I find that crazy that because it's a public entity, they should be transparent, and they literally hired a lawyer to stop you from getting documents that you're that you have a right to, that we have a right to see, right? That's true, but like, okay, it's upsetting, but it's not unusual. Like uh, my experience with. Uh, government agencies across the city and the county and the state is that all of them do that mm. except, for, except for a few most of them spend so much time energy and money on obstructing access to records um so yeah it's upsetting with the north figure association but not unusual I take money from developers to fund my campaign because people in my district aren't as capable of providing resources for my campaign.